I would like to welcome everyone to this uh, second day of COVID-5 conference seminar. And um, today uh, we were a little bit uh, last minute change in the schedule. So I apologize for that, but we will go ahead with the now our, uh, our speaker, Rembao Li from uh, Chinese University of Hong Kong. And uh, he's going to talk about the quantum sensing of correlations in accessible to nonlinear spectroscopy. And both floor is yours. Thank you. Okay. Excellent. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, thank you, uh, Professor Kak Mayan. And of course, uh, uh, yeah, thanks to uh, Hum for inviting me to this uh, event. Okay. So today, uh, my talk is about the uh, how to use the quantum sensors to extract the uh, correlations uh, uh, that's uh, not uh, accessible to usual uh, nonlinear spectroscopy or some other conventional methods. Okay. So this work was done uh, in collaboration with uh, two of my postdocs, uh, Dr. Ping Wang and uh, Chang Chen. Uh, so we know that actually, you know, any information that we can uh, obtain about a physical system, okay, we are talking about the physics. Uh, so it's uh, you know more or less uh, a kind of correlations or statistics. Uh, of course, uh, if we want to measure uh, physical quantity, we actually measure the exponential value of a certain kind of quantity. In statistics, this is called the first moment or the first order correlation function. Uh, sometimes we also want to study the fluctuation and the variance. Uh, uh, so this kind of variance uh, is uh, actually the second moment in statistics. Uh, or the second order correlation function, okay? And the famous uh, example of this second uh, order correlation function in physics is the linear response function, uh, which actually is the average of uh, the commutators between uh, two operators, uh, one applied at the early time, another is measured at a, a later time, okay? Right, and of course, this kind of uh, correlations uh, um, have uh, uh, importance in physics. Uh, uh, especially uh, if we look at the quantum mechanics, uh, uh, it's more, uh, it's, it's uh, actually all about the statistics. Uh. So the fundamental of quantum mechanics is summarized by this uh, beautiful formula. Uh, that is the variance of position times the variance of the uh, momentum is always greater or equal to uh, h bar over two. Okay. Right. And uh, this kind of correlations, uh, you know, can also, can, can also be used uh, to uh, a test of the quantum foundation, uh, such as the famous uh, Bayer uh, inequality or its later version. Okay, so if you measure two spins okay, uh, along two sets of uh, uh, coordinates, and then you actually got a correlation. If it's uh, a classical hidden variable theory, and this correlation function is always less than two, for example, right? And but the quantum states uh, can violate this uh, uh, inequality, okay, so that uh, uh, the quantum theory does not uh, have a hidden variable uh, interpretation. Okay. So another test of foundation is this uh, so-called uh, Nagat Garg inequalities. Uh, so it's actually a set of uh, inequalities uh, uh, about uh, the correlation functions at different times uh, of uh, physical quantity. Okay. And so this is just one one of the examples. Right. And so conventionally. Uh, a widely used method to, uh, you know, uh, to uh, measure this uh, correlation functions is the uh, spectroscopy or the nonlinear spectroscopy. Okay, so in the spectroscopy, actually, we kind of, uh, uh, you know, apply a force, a classical force, to a quantum system. Okay, such as the electric field. For example, we can cover optical field to, uh, you know, a quantum system which has operator d, right? So this gives us the interaction. And then the response uh, is the measurement of the change of physical quantity at a later time, okay? This one can be expanded order by order with respect to this uh, perturbation field, okay? So such, a, as we can, uh, such that we can have a first order linear response and the second order response, a third order, okay? so on and so forth, okay? And we know that uh, all this kind of, uh, you know, response of a system is governed by the quantum evolution under this uh, perturbation. Uh, if we do the, do the perturbation expansion, okay? The evolution of the density matrix of the system, you know, have a zero order, and then the first order, which contains the commutator between this operator and the 
uh, you know, system, a density matrix. Okay, and then you, if you expand it to the second order, then you have the commutator, you know, uh, showing up twice, right? And then you can go on and on. You then have this commutator, so, you know, to the third order and the fourth order, so on and so forth. But all kinds of uh, uh, nonlinear spectroscopy will give us the correlation functions you know, to up to your orders if we want, right? Uh, for example, the third order nonlinear nonlinear uh, uh, spectroscopy is given by these uh, uh, commutators, okay, between the uh, four operators, basically it's the operators at four times, okay. Right, so a limitation of this uh, nonlinear spectroscopy method is that uh, uh, only the commutator co correlation functions can be detected, right. So you cannot detect the correlation function using this uh, nonlinear spectroscopy uh, that uh, contains uh, uh, anti-commutator, for example, right. And so in recent years, uh, there's a new idea uh, in this uh, nonlinear spectroscopy, so called a quantum nonlinear spectroscopy. Basically, so we try to replace the uh, classical perturbation, like the optical field, with uh, a quantum object such as a quantum light or entangled photons, for example. Okay, and for example, if you use the entangled photons as a prop, uh, one can actually achieve uh, uh, improvement uh, in both the spectral and the temporal resolution. And this, of course, uh, shouldn't be possible if you use the classical light, right? So this is actually is a very interesting, uh, you know, example. Okay, so if we if we want to know more, and you know, there's a very nice review article, uh, article by Mukerel and his uh, 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 colleagues. And uh, however, if we use the photons or the photon counts as a method to achieve this kind of correlation functions, uh, there's uh, quite some. Uh, limitation. Okay, so because the, the measurement basis of photon states actually uh, cannot be easily uh, chosen. Okay, so there are only a limited limited sets of uh, measurement basis that you can use. So in general, we can consider uh, you know a quantum sensor and the target. So this is the uh, so for example, we can consider a, a spin, a central spin, interacting with uh, many other spins, which are the targets to be detected. Okay. And if we have both of them are quantum system, and then we say that uh, the evolution, because of the interaction between them, will induce uh, uh, entanglement. And then this uh, entanglement will make the measurement uh, on the sensor is actually also a measurement of the target. This uh, measurement of the target is called a poly type two measurement. And then we look at the correlation functions of the measurements on this uh, measurement. And uh, we can see that uh, they are actually related to the correlation functions of the targets. And by choosing the uh, initial state of the sensor and the measurement basis of this uh, 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 sensor, and then we can actually realize the detection of arbitrary uh, correlation functions. Right, so this is the uh, quantum circuits diagram for this uh, uh, sensing process. Suppose we have a sensor denoted by S uh, has the initial state given by rho S. And also we have uh, a target which is denoted as the rule B. And then they have interaction, you know, uh, that's the coupling between the system operator, the sensor operator S and uh, the target operator B, right? And then after the interaction for a short period of time, okay? And they, they will, you know, establish entanglement between the two systems. And then we do the measurement uh, only on the uh, system, okay? So if this entanglement is uh, uh, weak or the interaction time is short, is short and then this uh, measurement uh, on the sensor spin actually is uh, going to be a weak measurement uh, of this uh, above the beam. Okay. Right. So the difference between this uh, uh, sensor uh, target interaction and uh, the nonlinear spectroscopy is that uh, not the perturbation actually is a quantum object. It's not a classical force. So S itself is an operator. Right. And then if we look at the evolution of the whole system, so again, we still have this uh, density matrix evolves by this commutator between the interaction and the density operator. But however, this uh, uh, interaction contains two operators, right? One is the, system, uh, the, the sensor operator, another is the, uh, the target operator. So if we try to separate them, you actually have two terms. One contains the anti-commutator between the system, the sensor operator and the sensor state. Another one, and then you times the commutator, you know, between this uh, uh, target operator and the target state, right? So this is just the usual term, 
uh, for a classical problem. But however, because the state, the, the sensor is a quantum object, uh, so you can also have a commutator between the state of the sensor and uh, its uh, operator S. Now you have this uh, anti commutator, right? So you have both terms, okay? So that means uh, uh, you can have both the commutator and the anti commutator showing up in the evolution, okay? And the, this commutator, of course, is the difference between the uh, you know, exchange orders of the products, uh, which will be zero uh, for the class of quantities, right? And then this uh, anti commutator is a symmetric arrangement of this product. Uh, but this term, however, we're not sure about if we have a classical problem, right? So that means if by using the quantum sensor, we actually have uh, uh, new opportunities uh, to access uh, all kinds of uh, uh, correlation functions of the target. Uh, if we can design the initial state of the sensor and I can choose the uh, measurement basis of, uh, of this uh, uh, sensor, right? So this is a, a table just uh, to summarize, uh, you know, different kinds of uh, a prop and uh, targets, you know, and to see what kind of information can be retrieved by by the by the sensing process. Okay, and suppose we have a, a classical prop and a classical target, right? So this is just the classical physics, and then we have interaction, and the evolution of the system. The response is actually governed by this uh, so-called uh, Poisson bracket. Okay, and then the accessible information will be all symmetric. Uh, uh, arrangement of the quantities. Okay, so this is a, because of that class of quantities. So the order is not really important. So they are just the usual first moment, the second moment, the third moment, and so on and so forth, right? So that's the uh, um, you know what kind of information we can achieve, uh, we can retrieve about the classical system using the classical uh, prop. Uh, however, we can also use in the classical field such as the optical waves, uh, AFM tips. Uh, uh, the magnetic resonance coils, right? So on and so forth. Uh, using this kind of uh, classical props to detect the quantum systems such as atoms, spins, right? And solid state systems, okay? And then the interaction as we, uh, you know, uh, learned earlier, right? So it's given by this commutator uh, between the interaction and the, uh, the, the, the quantum system state, right? So this one contains only the commutator between this uh, uh, operator B and the and the target uh, state, and then the correlation function is just the nonlinear spectroscopy uh, response, so which contains all kinds of uh, commutators okay, between the operators at different times, right? So that's the one we have uh, talked about. But of course, you can also use a classical uh, problem such as photons, spins, forums, right, uh, to detect the classical quantities such as gravitational waves, magnetic fields. Temperature, right? So this is called a, a parameter estimation in the sensing uh, field. Okay, and then you can see that uh, uh, now we have, uh, you know, the evolution is is given by this, right? So there's no evolution of the classical parameter, but only the evolution of the sensor state. Okay, so in this case, uh, we also have the correlation functions the same as, uh, um, you know, uh, for the classical problem interacting a classical target. Okay. So because of this is the only correlation function that we can have for a classical object, right? And, and then you can see that in this case, the quantum sensing actually is just to, it, it does not obtain any new information about the classical objects, but just to enhance the measurement, right? Uh, the most interesting part is this uh, a quantum sensor uh, to detect the quantum object. Uh, such as we use the photons, the spins, or photons to detect the photons, the spins, and the, and the photons, right? So this is the case we have just uh, discussed. So we have this interaction between two quantum objects, S and B, and then we have this commutator, you know, between this interaction and the whole system, and then it can be separated into two parts. So it contains the commutator and the times the and the commutator, or the and the commutator times the commutator, right? And then this way we can obtain all kinds of correlation functions. Uh, that could contain uh, one commutator and one anti commutator, right? So on and so forth, okay? Right. So the general scheme is like this one. So we can uh, have a sensor prepared, for example, in the initial state uh, X. Uh, we assume this is a spin half. Uh, so X is just the spin state in the X direction. And then this uh, spin actually can be affected by a classical field, but can also be coupled to a quantum object, uh, uh, rho B, right? With interaction. 
uh, SC times this B. And this, uh, this uh, interaction at different times could be different, right? And then we do the measurement along a certain axis, uh, sigma k. And this can give us results of plus one or minus one, right? And then we can uh, just keep doing this one. And then we can take three, for example, uh, measurements, and then look at the correlation between them, right? So this is called, a, for example, third order correlation function, GIJK. Of course, you can also uh, choose the second order or fourth order uh, to look at the different uh, uh, correlation functions. And then by choosing the initial state you know, to be X or to be Y, and by choosing the measurement basis uh, to be X, Y, Z, or any other directions, uh, we can actually uh, you know, obtain different kinds of correlation functions of this uh, 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 target, okay? So these are just a few examples, okay? And you know, depending on the measurement basis, okay? So for the details, uh, and so uh, we have released uh, all kinds of possibilities uh, in this uh, PR paper. Uh, uh, about three years ago, okay. Right, so this is one of the example uh, for the application, okay. So if we just choose the initial state to be X and then do the measurement of Y, so this basically measure how, how fast uh, this sensor spin is rotating, right? So if it's rotated the Y direction, you can see that uh, the measurement will be always uh, plus one. If it's rotated to the Z, uh, minus Y direction, you got a minus one, right? So, so depending on how strong is the interaction or the, the field, and then you can have uh, different probabilities to measure this one to be plus one, minus one. And then you do the correlations of them. You can actually look at the correlation of this field at different times, right? And uh, we can make this interaction to be very short. There is a weak measurement. And then the correlation function that give us this kind of oscillating um, because of the spin notation. Uh, uh, if we choose the natural vacuum center spin as the sensor and the carbon 13 as uh, uh, the target to be probed. Uh, so we can see that this uh, oscillating frequency is just the frequency of the carbon 13 spin. And then there's a decay, and this decay is because of the measurement induced the feedback. So that's the measurement induced the uh, decoherence. Okay. And of course, we can make this measurement to weaker and weaker, and then they make this decay is uh, uh, very small. And then if we do the Fourier transform, you're going to have a very sharp peak. So that means we're going to have very good uh, spectral resolution. Okay. So this is the, uh, the best spectral resolution um, people have uh, uh, achieved okay, uh, for single Euclid spin uh, magnetic resonance. So you can see this is 3.4 hertz. So uh, using this one, people can easily uh, distinguish two carbon-13 at different, uh, uh, you know, chemical environment. That means they have different distance uh, from the um, natural vacuum center. Both of them are actually very weakly covered. Okay, so this was done uh, in Stuttgart by my collaborators. And and also you can use uh, high order correlation functions to distinguish uh, different kinds of uh, uh, noises. Uh, we know that. Uh, if you only look at the second order correlation functions, you just have a frequency, you just have the amplitude. But this could be the same for all kinds of uh, uh, noise, right? You can have a Gaussian noise, telegraph noise, uh, or, or random phase the uh, AC field. You can have uh, noise from a quantum object such as a single spin, or two spin, or spin one, spin half, and so on and so forth, right? So you can have different kinds of uh, noise sources. And if you only look at the second order correlation functions, actually, you, you don't see uh, much difference. So at least you don't see any. Uh, uh, qualitatively uh, difference, okay? And however, if we look at a third order correlation function, you can see that uh, the Gaussian noise have this uh, 12 peaks in the frequency domain, okay? So th this, uh, so we do the Fourier transform uh, of two frequencies, so between IJ and JK, okay? And then if it's a telegraph noise, you can only see four peaks, okay? And for the random uh, phase, the AC field, you see six peaks, okay? So they are actually quite a, uh, they're qualitatively different, right? So they have fingerprints uh, patterns. So you can immediately tell what kind of noises they are by looking at this third order uh, correlation functions. And then if it's quantum spin, actually it's also very interesting. If I have one spin, you know that one spin is very similar to the telegraph noise. Okay, so you can see that uh, the spectrum actually are very close. However, if you really look at them, uh, if we compare the second order and third order, they still are quite different, okay? So you can see that uh, uh, the strength will be very different. And uh, if we do have the two spins, and this pattern uh, is also distinct. And if you have more and more spins, we know that if you have more and more independent type of noises, and then you're going to approach the Gaussian noise, right? So if you look at six spins, actually the, uh, the, the pattern, the frequency pattern is very similar to the Gaussian noise, okay? So, so anyway, by you know, taking a look of this uh, sort of all the Gaussian functions, uh, and actually we can distinguish uh, and, uh, uh, noises of different types, being classical or quantum, the Gaussian or telegraph, and so on and so forth, right? And so this one actually has been partially verified by the experiments uh, 
uh, in my collaborator group in Stuttgart. Right, so this is another example uh, that we can apply this uh, uh, you know, quantum correlation uh, measurement. As the, so in the usual sensor uh, task, so we have a sensor spin. Okay, it interacts with the uh, target spin, which can be, for example, um, precise in a bottle B field with frequency omega zero. Right, with the interaction given by an uh, effective field you know, for this uh, target spin, which is just hyperfine coupling constant A, for example, if it's electron and nuclear spin, right, and times the operator of this target spin. And then you look at the correlation function, uh, you second order correlation function, we see a peak right here, right? Uh, but in the reality, there are always noises, classical noises, uh, also affected this sensor spin. So that means that there will be another field, a big DC, that's a classical noise. So if you look at the correlation functions uh, of both fields together, actually you see something like this one, okay? So it's very difficult, uh, it's almost impossible for us to identify which peak is from the target spin. Right, because they, are, they could have a similar strength, okay? So there's no signal to noise, uh, uh, enough signal to noise ratio, okay? So we cannot identify, and you know, the target spin in this uh, classical noise background. Uh, but however, remember, so if you look at the high order correlation functions, uh, the quantum object could have different kinds of correlation functions, right? Uh, but the classical noise, they only have uh, anti-commutator uh, correlation functions. So that means if we measure the correlation functions uh, such as this one, which contains uh, the anti-commutator and then commutator and the commutator and the anti-commutator, and for the classical noise, this will be absolutely zero. And for the quantum noise, so this will be non-zero. So that means this will be a background free detection, right? So this is the schematic. So if you uh, look at the spectrum of this fourth order correlation function, which contains commutator and anti-commutator, uh, you are supposed to see no contribution from this classical noise. Uh, so, and uh, this way to remove the noise effect actually is uh, uh, it's universal. It does not depend on the statistics. Uh, it could be Gaussian or non-Gaussian telegraph, right? It does not depend on the uh, spectral properties. It could be white or it could be color, right? It could be uh, omega noise, right? Uh, it does not depend on the strength of the noise either, right? It could be strong or weak, right? So, so this is a universal way to exclude the effects of the classical noise background in the sensing task, okay? It's a totally new, okay? And then indeed we, we tested this one for MV center coupled to a nuclear spin uh, together with the background noise. And you can see that the, the classical noise give us a spectrum and the quantum target also give us a, a spectrum, okay? This is just the uh, discrete Fourier transform. You can see that, the, uh, you know, at the omega zero, this just gives us a sharp peak, right? Okay, but with the broadening because of the decay. And then you can see that uh, and no, no matter how you increase the number of measurements, so that means no matter how you increase the data acquisition time, so the cask noise uh, uh, always, uh, you know, increase proportionally. That means if you have a, a cask noise too strong, or if you have your, you know, a broadening of the quantum target too, too big, uh, that means the, the height of this uh, peak will be limited. And then the signal to noise ratio will be not be will not be sufficient, right? So that means uh, if we plot the uh, data acquisition time required to see uh, enough signal to noise ratio as a function of the cast noise strength SC and the broadening of your quantum target peak resonance, you can see that uh, when eight of them are too strong, okay? So when both of them are too strong, you can see no signal to noise ratio at all, no matter how long you increase the uh, data acquisition time, okay? So there's a, a, bright, uh, a blind spot for this classical, uh, for this second order uh, uh, correlation sensing. Uh, this actually is a method used widely in the, uh, in the quantum sensing uh, tasks, okay? And however, if we look at the fourth order correlation function, okay, and you can see that uh, no matter how strong is the noise, no matter, how, you know, how broad is your, uh, the, the peak of this uh, quantum target resonance, uh, you can always uh, increase the measurement time. Okay, of course, eventually it will be not really an uh, economic. Okay, but uh, you know, in, in, in principle, you can always increase the measurement time so that you can see sufficient uh, uh, signal to noise ratio, right? So make this one is always greater than one, so that you can see the contribution from this uh, quantum target, right? So this make a, 
a classic noise free detection okay, by the fourth order quantum correlation function. Okay. Of course, you can also use other kinds of correlation functions okay, to uh, to realize a, a similar uh, you know object objectives. Right. So this is a summary um, of uh, my talk. So basically, uh, so I have uh, tried to uh, introduce uh, this idea of uh, quantum nonlinear spectroscopy using uh, you know, sequential measurement and look at the correlation functions. So we see that the uh, arbitrary correlation functions uh, of quantum targets actually can be uh, uh, extracted. Right? So I, I take a few examples. Uh, one particular example is the application to classical noise free detection of a quantum object. Okay? And then the ongoing uh, research is uh, trying to use this uh, high order quantum correlation functions uh, uh, to test, uh, for example, quantum foundation. Uh, such as the high order like the gap inequalities okay and also could provide a new approach to quantum many body physics right? because the conventional uh, spectroscopy can only detect uh, certain kinds of correlation functions but now we have a way to look at the new kinds of correlation functions and uh, so th uh, that will provide a uh, you know open a new window uh, you know to the uh, you know properties of the states in quantum many body systems okay uh, thank you very much Thank you very much um, for this, for introducing this new approach to quantum sensing. Very, very uh, interesting presentation. Thank you. Um, and then before I go to the question on the chat, I just would like to remind everyone, I think, which I forgot in the beginning, these talks will be streamed on YouTube and they will be also available to watch afterwards um, on, on demand. So um, I believe you can see the chat uh, and then, but, but I think it will be a good idea to read the question to everyone. Um, so the question is uh, from Ekrem Taha uh, and are there any protocols to prevent the coupling between the sensor scheme and the amounted environmental schemes which are in proximity to target spatially? Uh, so I, I could do, could you? Um, uh, um, yeah, I mean, you can also see it on the chat, uh, I believe, but I can repeat it. So he's trying to ask can, that. Okay. He's he's most interested to hear about is there any protocols to prevent the coupling between the sensor spin and the unwanted environmental spins? I see. Uh, uh, indeed, there are many uh, spins in the background, and in principle, they are all quantum, right? And uh, so, first of all, if the the carbon strength is uh, much weaker than the one that we are interested in. Okay, so you know that, that if you have a magnet, in principle, the magnet is also made of many many spins, right? Uh, so, but those interactions are extremely weak, and then they all contribute actually. Uh, so I didn't uh, uh, talk of, uh, in details, uh, but however, you can imagine that because of these uh, commutators, uh, so only the spins, uh, only the quantum op operator from the same quantum object uh, will have uh, non-zero. Uh, commutators, right? So that means, uh, uh, so the signal is proportional to the quantum signal is proportional to the number of uh, uh, the spins. Uh, but however, uh, the order, if we go to the fourth order, third order, right? So the the the, the, the correlation function is proportional to the interaction strength to the third order, or fourth order. Okay, we know that the the number of uh, spins times the uh, the coupling strength uh, squared. It's usually a constant, so that means uh, this kind of uh, weak cover the background the spins uh, with a country the almost zero uh, signal. So this is the one thing. And uh, secondly, if the spin are not that weakly coupled to the to the center spin, so in principle you can detect all of them. But if you really want to just detect a certain kind of spins, suppose I want to detect the spin only at a certain frequency, uh, what can we do? So we can use, for example, dynamic decoupling sequence. Uh, so that only the spin at this frequency uh, would interact uh, effectively with the sensor. And then we can uh, decouple those spins which do not have the right frequencies, right? So that's another way to, uh, uh, you know, to exclude uh, the spins which are not that weakly coupled to the sensor, okay? And there, of course, uh, there is some limitation. Uh, there will be a spectral resolution, right? So if uh, there are, the, you know, that the dynamic decoupling uh, spectral resolution is given by the one level uh, T2. Uh, T2 is the coherence time of the sensor. So you cannot do uh, 
much better than uh, excluded the spins, uh, you know, of different frequencies uh, in, in that sense. Okay. But however, as you can see that uh, uh, in this uh, spectrum, you can see that if you have two spins, uh, you can actually see a different pattern in the spectrum. Okay. So that means uh, by by looking at the different patterns, you can also uh, tell yourself that uh, uh, there are one spin or two spins. Okay. And then you can uh, uh, deduce like a you know, um, you know the, 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 the uh, quite some information about the, the space system. Okay. Okay, I think it's really good to hear that there are different op options to do that that's available. Um, and uh, the next question is from Jehun Busai, and he's he's trying to understand if there's uh, with this information provided. Is it possible to improve the coherence via feedback? It's possible to. I cannot see the chat in uh, the chat. Oh yes, oh. Right, I can see them right now. Okay. Okay. Um, uh. Is it is it possible to improve the coherence via feedback with this information? So in principle, this information can be used to improve the coherence via feedback. Uh, yes, but it's. Uh, uh, experimentally, it's not that easy. Okay, so you need uh, some uh, very fast uh, electronics, for example. Okay, but uh, if it's nuclear spins, probably it's, it's, it's doable. Uh, in principle, yes. Uh, in the in the in technically, uh, uh, it's uh, it's not always uh, uh, you know convenient to do this. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, I think with that. We that's all of the questions I could see as well. So yeah, I think thank the time you. is also up, right? <laughs> yes. Thank you very much once yeah, more. Thank you. Okay. Uh, we really appreciate joining us. Thank yeah, you. Thanks a lot. So I'm going to stop sharing. Yes, please. Thanks.